is a tough time slot right after lunch, and it was a big and delicious lunch at that. So we're going to start off with a little deal. You guys try your best not to be bored. I'll try my best not to be boring. How's that for a deal? Does that work? All right. Well, I just want to thank you guys today for the opportunity to be able to speak about church planting. Uh, I was thinking about the word humbled this week and last week as I was preparing. And, and to be honest, that word humbled has always just sounded pretentious to me. Because it, it, usually in the context, uh, you think that the person means to say that they're honored. You know, that, wow, this group of my peers has seen fit to, to put me into this position and recognize certain things. Uh, like, when, like when somebody's named the MVP of baseball or something like that, you say, I'm honored. But I've been thinking through just this idea of humbled, and I, I am so deeply, deeply humbled to be able to open up God's Word with you in this setting. Um, some of you guys know that it was seven or eight years ago, whenever it was, my wife and I came out here just battered and beat up from ministry. And the Lord used this setting as a life raft to breathe life back into us. So to be able to just come and glean is humbling, but to be able to come and participate is amazing. As I watch people that have been tilling the soil for decades and people who I've been looking up to for years who could have been up here opening up God's Word instead, and, and people who are just now starting to step out and take the stuff that we've been learning about in settings like this for years, and you guys are embarking on, you're doing it, man. You're planting churches to the glory of God and for the good of the gospel. That is awesome, and it's humbling to be a part of. And as much as I'm blessed by the ministry of so many people here, I passionately love the ministry of dead men. I, I, I love just old dead people that write big, thick books. Uh, I'm passionate about that. I love their legacy. I, I love their fruit. I have a son named Calvin. My wife has a Calvin tattoo on her arm. How many of you Calvinists can say that? None. I didn't think so. John Calvin didn't even have a Calvin tattoo. So I'm like a leg up on that guy. And man, one of the guys who's just blessed me stupid is the Scottish reformer John Knox. And I'm going to talk a little bit about him this afternoon. But I remember so early on in my faith reading verses like Psalm 2.8 where David says, Ask of me and I will give of the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. And I remember thinking, God, if this is if this is true, if I'm reading this as what it's really saying, I'm not asking you for a nation here. I'm asking you for Bricktown, New Jersey. And if I may be so bold, I'd like to ask you for Point Pleasant and maybe Seaside and maybe Abraham. And as you start praying like that, you start to have this like God and, Je and Abraham from Genesis 18 kind of interaction going on, right? And you're like, God, if maybe if it would be okay for your servant to add Manasquan to the list. And, and, and Lord, forgive me, but grant me this one last request. Could, could you add Brielle? and maybe Belmar, and maybe Spring Lake. And lastly, Lord, if, if you just added Tom's River and Lakewood, if that's not so bold, might I ask that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. And the times where I've just been bold in my faith, uh, and the times where you're just encouraged in the Lord, and I've been before the Lord just boldly, you realize I can approach the throne of grace and boldly ask these things of my Savior, not because of my talent to go and carry out these things, but because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And then I waver, and I'm like, wow, God planting this one little insignificant church where nobody knows my name, nobody knows the name of our town, and this little nowhereville in New Jersey is really hard. And it comes at great cost to me, and it comes at great cost to my family, and I'm tired. I've been on both sides. And then you read the words of a man like John Knox, my second favorite reformer, who looked out over the hills of Edinburgh and proclaimed, give me Scotland or I die. And man, I read that and I get fired up. And I, I, I could, 
I could watch Braveheart 10,000 times and it wouldn't fire me up that much is John Knox, the real reformer who prayed that with his heart breaking over his city. One biographer said this. He said, perhaps more than anything else, John Knox is known for his prayer, give me Scotland or I die. Knox's prayer was not an arrogant demand, but the passionate plea of a man willing to die for the sake of the pure preaching of the gospel and the salvation of his countrymen. Knox's greatness lay in his humble dependency on our sovereign God to save his people, revive a nation, and reform his church. Oh, I love this. As is evident from his preaching and prayer, Knox believed neither in the power of his preaching nor the power of his prayer, but in the power of the gospel, the power of God unto salvation, who sovereignly ordains preaching and prayer as a secondary means in the salvation of his people. And I read that, and I look out over the hopeless landscape of New Jersey, and I'm emboldened to say, God, give me Jersey, or I die. I want to be a man that bleeds for my people and for a place all of my life. Amen? So, with all of that said, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 17. If you want to open there, and we're going to be looking at Joel 1, I'd like to give you some time because that's one of those little two-pager books that take people 10 minutes to get to. So if you want to keep a finger in there, I'm going to pray real quick, and then we're just going to dive in very quickly because I have a lot of ground to cover. God, may your Spirit anoint the preaching of your Word. Hide me behind your cross that I wouldn't get in the way of what you want to do. And I pray, Lord, that we would believe that the preaching of your word is just as powerful as it was in the book of Acts and your spirit would fall, Lord. Not that we have to invite you here, you're here, but that your manifest presence would bring glory to Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be looking at Acts 17 this morning. And and if we start off in verse 6, it's, it's just a verse that is just absolutely beautiful and it's captivated my mind. Um, it says, and we'll move on from there, um, they, they dragged out Jason and some of the brothers before the authorities shouting, Look, listen to this, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. I'm guessing that in one way or another, every person in this room has been captivated by Acts 17, verse 6. We want to be the kind of men and women who are so involved in this, this crazy, miraculous, only God can do it or else it's a failure kind of work of the gospel of turning the world upside down. And we want to believe that we're going to plant churches that are going to be used in turning the world upside down. We want to believe that the Crossway Chapel network is going to be a network that God is going to use to turn the world upside down. We want to look at our cities and be able to say, God, give me Loveland. Give me Alamouts. Give me Alt. Give me Fort Collins or I die, Lord. We want to be able to heartily amen that, right? Amen? So I, I think that everybody here at one time or another has prayed, Lord, God, let me be the kind of person that earns the slander that the early church earned because this wasn't meant as a compliment. It was scandalous. It was slanderous when they said these things in verse 6. This slander of turning our world upside down. As we dig into Acts 17, I just want to acknowledge something before we get to the text that I really want to hit on. That if you've been around church planting circles for any period of time, you've probably heard this passage used a lot in church planting circles. And in fact, so much that I'll bet you a couple of you rolled your eyes when I told you to turn to Acts chapter 17. If that was you, just own it and repent. But um, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm just kidding with you guys. But I mean, I'm kind of kidding, right? I went to Moody Bible Institute. I don't know if there's any other Moody people out there. But at the Moody Missions Conference, you know, being here and somebody telling you to turn to Acts 17 is like going to Moody and somebody saying, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And I remember going to the conference when I was a student, and there was this missionary that got up and said, open up in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. And then this next missionary comes up and open up in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. And as I was kind of cynical, as students in Bible college sometimes are, by the time the third missionary gets up, you're like, can I just preach your application for you? I mean, who will go for us? Here am I, Lord, send me. Yada, yada, now let's get a bunch of 19-year-olds guilted up to the altar. I mean, that's the way that you kind of felt being in that setting. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be flippant. Um, but I, I'm also an Acts 29 pastor. Don't hold that against me. I'm, I'm duly 
affiliated. And for those of you that don't know Acts 29 or what it is, it's the network that kind of brought you hair product and men wearing t-shirts that were so tight that they border on immodesty. And you're welcome for that. that that's our contribution to the church planting world. Um, but we had this higher profile church known as Mars Hill that was a part of our network. And Mars Hill translated as just Areopagus, which comes from the end of Acts chapter 17. But it wasn't just the name of a church, as some of you guys probably know. And if you don't know, it's not really that important that you know celebrity churches for you to understand what I'm going to dial into here. But it went beyond that. It was a philosophy of ministry. I gleaned a lot of things from the end of Acts 17 with men who are very capable of opening God's Word, um, such as seeing an open door in the culture and proclaiming Jesus to be that unknown God that meets that need that's vacant in that culture. And it, and it carried with it this idea of intellectually engaging people with the Gospel. And it had this idea of bringing the Gospel to bear on the marketplace centers in urban centers of our cultures and seeing cultural renewal kind of emanate out through that. And it carries this idea of knowing the art and the culture and the literature of the people so that you can use it as a spring board for the gospel as Paul did with the writings of the Epicurean philosophers at the end of Acts chapter 17. And all that stuff is really good and I've gleaned a ton from it. If it wasn't, I would have never pursued relationships with those folks. And it kind of gives you an idea why a passage like this is taught so much in circles like church planting conferences, but it's not what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon. I want to talk to you about the way that Paul prepared his heart before he went into the Areopagus. I want to preach to your hearts here for the next 20 minutes. It amazes me that we could be in such a rush to get to the missiological importance of the back half of Acts chapter 17 but in all the messages that I've ever listened to on this great passage, only once have I sat in a conference where anybody packed, unpacked the necessity of the heart implications of verses 16 through 21. I mean, yes, Paul was excited to bring the gospel to bear in this new city that he was in. I mean, if you're going to be used... You better be excited that you're going into that city. I've been a part of an argument that kind of runs in some of the circles that I find myself running in about whether you need to love your city in order to plant there. And that's nuts that that's even an argument. You better love your city. Man, I bleed New Jersey. I'm so Jersey sure that I make myself sick with all of my fist bumping and eating pork roll, egg, and cheese. And if you don't know what that means, that's my culture. That's the place that I'm called into. And it's awesome, and it's radical, and it's beautiful, and it's messy. I'm of the belief, man, that if, if you're armed with the gospel, and it's not coupled with a love for your people or a love for your city, that when the gospel work gets hard, you're going to want out of that city. Whether God is calling you there or not, the arguments become very convincing for you to leave when it's not bearing fruit at the rate that your ministry, you think, ought to be bearing fruit. Because basically, even if you're not falling in, out of love with the gospel, it could become really easy to fall out of love with a people and fall out of love for a place. If you don't believe me, just ask Moses. And his people continually fell out of love with a place, right? Isn't that the whole book of Exodus and Numbers? Why'd you take us out of there? That place where we were being whipped and we were made slaves, but they had onions. You know, that was pretty awesome. I don't know why they loved onions so much, but they were passionate about onions. And, and, and Moses, the dude continually fell out of love with his people. I mean, how many times did he just have those prayers? And man, I read Exodus a lot in the first year of our planting a church. Because I got it when he was like, Lord, just let me hit him once. Come on, just, just once. It'll be between you and me, Jesus. Let me extend the right hand of fellowship to this arrogant people. Um, feeling, I'm sorry, I have a big head, so these things fall off easily. Um, feeling called to stay faithful to a place after the initial thrill is gone is really tough, man. And again, I love my city. I love the old, crusty, northeast, Catholic, religiosity folks. 
that live in my city. So much so that I just could not get used to how nice you people are in Colorado. I just always thought you were up to something. And I was just like, I'm on to you. I'm going to figure you out. Um, I mean, it, it was weird for me. But you better believe that there are some rough days. And, and in those rough days, I fantasize about coming back here, man. Colorado is my Egypt. I confess it to you here at the pulpit. I'm like, man, remember how beautiful it was in Colorado, Lord. Remember when all I was doing was just working on couches over at Lazy Boy and nobody was calling me up in the middle of the night to tell me that they're pregnant. And man, that, that was awesome. Couches don't get pregnant. And it, it was cool. Um, but when I think like that, I'm looking for leaks and onions, man. But, but it's not lakes and onions. It's Deschutes Brewery and Cafe Mexicali. But man, Paul was enthused to engage the gospel with some of the greatest thinkers. He, he seemed to just shine whenever he was in that setting. And, and, and that is encouraging to see him connect with the culture shapers. We talked about that a little bit in the first breakout session. And yes, Paul set forth some really cool missiological paradigms at the end of Acts chapter 17. And if you don't know what that means, ask Jeremy Holton and he'll break that, that down to you. But I mean, we talked about that in the first breakout session, preaching the gospel in these areas of strategy, and all of that took work to be able to quote the poets of the culture and be able to just weave seamlessly the gospel in and out through that. It took took great work. I mean, don't don't kid yourselves on that. But as big as all of this stuff is, it's secondary to what I want to answer of how did these people be accused of turning the world upside down? Because you can have all of those things and not love your people. You could be adept at knowing the culture that you're in and not love a people. You could be adept at understanding everything that makes the people tick and the commerce and the industry and the arts of your area and not bring the gospel to bear on a people, which is why I don't understand how verses 22 through 34 are taught without connecting them to verses 16 through 21, particularly at verse 16. I want to unpack with you in my remaining minutes what love for your city and love for a people really means. Look at verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. It says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And I, I love this verse. And there's so many practical verses that we're going to look at in terms of church planting. But if I had to isolate one and say that, man, if this is true about you, you are off to a great start, it would be verse 16. It says that when Paul went into Athens, he observed the city's idols and obstacles to the gospel, and his heart was deeply provoked inside of him. Now just get this mental image. Take yourself by faith for a second and picture Paul walking through the city and he's taking in all of these sights and as he does, his heart is breaking inside of him, but it fuels him. Think about that, man. That which the enemy could use to create discouragement or apathy is a motivation for Paul to give himself and give his life to the gospel work of this city. Aaron said in our first session here, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. And I want to add to it kind of the crux of this message. Unless the Spirit provokes our hearts and breaks us for the gospel, a people, and a place, then we labor aimlessly. Unless the Spirit provokes your heart and breaks you for the gospel, a people, and a place, then you labor aimlessly. And what does it look like for a heart to be provoked? What does it look like when you look at Acts 17, 16? And we're going to discuss that at our tables in a few moments. But why did this fuel Paul? How did this fuel Paul? What can we take away from the feeling that Paul felt as he walked through the city, provoked by the things that he saw going on around him? And I've been particularly captivated by Joel 1, 13 through 16 and how it pertains to church planting. So if you guys would just do me a favor and turn there really quick, because I would love for you guys to really enjoy this passage as well. 
It says, put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is not food cut off from before our eyes and joy and gladness from the house of our God? Man, I, I read that and I'm like, that's just as relevant today as it was when the prophet Joel wrote this. He says, gather your leaders, man. Gather those whose heart is supposed to be breaking for the things that you're seeing going on around you and weep before the porch and the altar. It's not about clever tricks and gimmicks. It's about your heart breaking as you see the same things that captivated Paul's heart and provoked him. And he's saying, weep over these things. Be affected by them. And I love the reason that he gives for the weeping. I mean, there's several. He gives the one reason where he says, because the offering that's due to your God is being withheld. How much of a fuel should that be for mission? Our God is infinitely worthy of everything. And he's saying, you see it, and you see it's not happening. And that's not okay. We shouldn't be okay with that. We shouldn't just say, oh, the secularization of society, you know. It's going to hell in a handbasket. No, he's saying weep over that stuff. But I love what he says even more as the fuel. Because that, I mean, that could be a pretty discouraging fuel if that's what he really looked at. He says the joy and the gladness is cut off from our people. And does that affect you when you when you read that? Is that not just a gorgeous heart motivation for the work that we're here to talk about and what God has called us to? Do you ever look at your city and just see all the people just diving headlong into the things that will never satisfy and then think of the deep satisfaction that you've been given in Christ? And I look at my life, I was somebody that radically chased after all of those things, only to have to be crushed under the weight of them, then to find out that Jesus was the satisfaction that my heart has longed for in all of those things that I ever pursued. I look at that prayer that Augustine prayed so long ago when he said, Lord, let my heart rest in nothing until it's satisfied only in you. I get that, man, and it just makes you want to cry out, Lord, who am I? that you've given me such deep satisfaction with my Lord Jesus Christ. My heart's desire is that they would be saved. In fact, I would consider myself accursed, even greater than that, cut off for the sake of my people knowing Jesus. This same Apostle Paul who spoke in verse 16 also said that in Romans chapter 9, verse 3. My people... Man, that's the people that I, I break for it so much because they're my people. Paul had a people so much so that he could say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this wasn't hyperbole when he said, I would rather be cut off if it was one Paul burning in hell or all of them coming to know Jesus. Don't let Paul burn in hell. He said that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because he was so provoked within him about what he wanted to see amongst his people. So what does it look like for a heart to be provoked? I think that picture in Joel is a big picture of it. It means identifying with your people so deeply, like Paul in Romans 9, that you would bleed and lay down everything for your people. As we're, we're not called to love church planting. We're called to love Jesus we're called to be about the work of the gospel. Church planting is just the locus of our calling to make disciples. That's it. I mean, if you come here and you hear love church planting, we've missed the mark. Church planting is only a vehicle for loving Jesus. Do you have a people that you are just so provoked that when you look at them, you say, they are my people. I mean like Stephen and Braveheart, like my people, my island, and this is where I want to see the gospel come to bear on. And you just got that crazy look in your eye because I'm called to this people. They're my people. And in that context, man, what was it that had Paul so provoked? He said that he observed this city that was filled with idols. And why was he provoked over that? Because 
He saw that people were satisfied with them to the neglect of being satisfied with Jesus. What are the unique cultural idols in your city that should be provoking your heart to where if you're here and you need a tune-up where you've just begun to say, you know what, it just is what it is. I'm just going to accept those and I'm just going to go fish where the fish are biting. Where do you need to be reminded, man, that Paul was provoked to the point where he broke over those things. And in my final couple of minutes, I just want to unpack how I got this wrong and loved a culture instead of loving a people. Once I heard Sam Storms say, and I want to quote him, that he has, he has fear for much of the church planting movement that he sees because many of the things that we are teaching people to celebrate in culture or at least appreciate may have been the very things that Paul was provoked for in this passage. I'm not here to preach against culture, guys. I, I, that, that, that's not my bag. That's not what I, I do. I just want to ask you, where is the direct link between the gospel and the things that you celebrate in culture? I'm not talking about a perforated line. Where's that direct link? That's why men like this could be said that they were turning the world upside down because there was a direct link to everything they celebrated and the gospel that is infinitely worthy to be celebrated. Look at Fort Collins, guys. There's, there's much to love, man. But for me to plant a church in Fort Collins tomorrow would be egregious sin against the Lord and against my people because my heart is not provoked for you people. I love you, but I'm not provoked for you. I don't look out at Fort Collins and say, God, give me Fort Collins or I die. But you know what? I'm grateful that Jeremy does. I'm grateful that Aaron does. I'm grateful with that whole gaggle of nut jobs from Mountain View do. I'm grateful that Mark does. Man, I got a spanking in this area just to be autobiographical as I was trying to go to Boulder. There was so much to love. If you don't know my story, I was the dirtiest of hippies. I went 45 days without showering one time. Like, I'm talking dirty, dirty hippies. So I walked through Boulder, and I'm like, you ain't got nothing on the dirty hippie that I was. And I identify with that culture, but guess what? I don't feel a calling to lay down my life for the sake of the gospel for the people in Boulder the way that I do in boring old Brick Township, New Jersey. That place is like a warm blanket to me when I go back into my culture. And every time I come here, I'm like, God, I am afraid of the fact that brick is getting on my nerves and I'm just going to stay here this time. And by the end of it, I'm like, I can't wait to get back to brick because I bleed for those people. Give me brick town or I die. And a calling has to go deeper than identifying with the unique cultural nuances of a culture, guys. That's kind of the whole crux of what I'm getting at here. I'll repeat it in case none of my other ramblings were coherent enough to make sense. A calling has to go deeper than identifying with the common interests and nuances of a culture. And that's so often where I feel like just teaching verses 22 through 34 misses the mark. No matter how much I enjoy the culture, guys, this world is not my home. You can't make this culture sweet enough. You can't make this culture beautiful enough for this world to ever become my home. I don't care how cool Old Town is. I don't care how cool it is walking on the boardwalk in my area. I walk through it and that world is still not my home. I was made for a city whose builder is God and whose hands were not made with human hands. And so were you. Our citizenship has to go deeper than anything pertaining to accoutrements that make our president, present citizenship nicer to live in. It has to. So as we close, i got a couple questions on the board for you guys to look at. What does it look like for your heart to be provoked? What would a Joel 1, 13-16 response to the Gospel look like as we survey the Gospel needs in our cities? What is the connect between turning the world upside down and having a spirit that's provoked. And maybe the biggest question I want you to get out of here is why is it dangerous to separate the two? Why is it dangerous to go into an area where, yeah, I want to turn the world upside down in the name of Jesus, but Jesus has not provoked your spirit for a people and a place? Why is it important that your heart is provoked before and prior to planting a church? Who are your people that you say, Lord, give me fill in the blank, or I die.
Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be able to preach your word. I pray that the discussion now would be even more fruitful as we discuss how to apply this to our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.